Okay, so let's go to our new topic. We before we go to exchange traded markets versus um, OTC markets, we have to ensure that um, I have to discuss a, another topic before that. That topic that precedes this, because we'll be discussing this topic in that. So let's look at your notes. Everything is pasted into your notes already. Okay, this is the topic that we need to cover. Okay, so now as we said, uh, the options module is over. Okay, the options module is over. We had that discussion yesterday as well on, on market makers. So um, now um, option market making. End of option module. We are moving back into the financial markets module. We covered a little bit yesterday, uh, and we did a lot of revision on trading. So there were a lot of questions on the trading system. Very good questions actually yeah. on trading system calculation. So which we did, dealt with. So today we are moving into the. We are coming back into the introduction to financial markets module. Okay. So you should also understand that the reason the course is being taught like this, obviously because we are constrained by the by the projects that we have. To do so ideally the way i would structure the material is first i would teach you all the introduction to financial markets which itself is a huge module okay because we have to cover capital markets we have to cover uh, all kinds of stuff okay which we have otc versus exchange traded we haven't even covered this this is actually a basic topic as you can see in even in the hull book it appears in the first chapter okay so um <clears throat> so but uh, anyway so we have not been able to cover it because in every case every course we have a project and so immediately the pressure is on me to give you the the basic uh, bare, ba uh, bare ba I mean uh, the bare essential uh, knowledge base to be able to execute the project in a sensible way so therefore I have to break my flow of the introductory material coverage and move into project specific material okay which we also had to do in the in the case of options but since we did options we have covered pretty much all of the basic option topics okay so uh, now again once we what we are going back to that's why this kind of material so you might wonder why is this material covered like this first we do some initial basics on trading on quotes bids and offers market makers this that then again we move into options now we're going back into OTC markets etc normally you would not be going into options coverage before looking at a topic like OTC versus exchange traded markets that's a much more basic topic but the reason we have to do it like this is because we are constrained by the projects and the necessity to cover the material that uh, helps you to do the project is that clear so everyone should understand why we are doing why we are proceeding in the manner in which we are proceeding right Okay, so the first topic we need now there's always that's why I talked about the sequencing of topics Sequencing of topics is very one of the main reasons. I have I don't use textbooks is I'm very uh, I'm not at all satisfied with about the sequencing of topics So actually when you discuss OTC markets versus exchange traded markets it helps to understand different types of risk Okay, because you'll see that distinction coming out in the OTC versus ETM So therefore we have to first talk about a preceding topic, which is like a a prerequisite a preceding topic is a taxonomy of risks actually maybe we should talk about this should be a plural a taxonomy of risks because there are different types of risks so if we do a taxonomy of students on this campus it would be a taxonomy of students which is plural okay right so the main two risks that we have to so these are the risks you can read them here okay what we, are we uh, is the font big enough Shristi? back bench okay yeah all right okay so uh, yeah so who else wanted to go out whoever wants to go out just one person at a time kanika keep watch that only one person goes out at it goes out at a time okay all right so you can you guys can reach read the five types of risk okay some people can some people sometimes talk about liquidity risk as a separate type of risk but i have not put it as a separate category of risk because i think liquidity risk really basically ends up manifesting as market risk okay and uh, so so basically what is market risk market risk you guys are already familiar with market risk it's you you have already seen it yourself you buy an option okay and then the option price starts falling Okay, or you buy an underlying asset, you buy a stock, and the stock price falls. For, uh, so when we are talking about risk, we are talking about a risk in a, uh, you know, one-sided perspective on risk, which is only from the loss side. We are not considering profit as as uh, risk because profit is also uncertain, but we don't consider profit as a risk. That's the way I approach it. Okay, in classical finance theory, uh, the perspective is actually more balanced. So they they use standard deviation as a measure of risk which means whether it's upside or downside it's still considered as risk okay so here like if i look at so here again so i've just gone long here on dollar yen 
so this I have put a stop over here actually and then I have some other buy orders in here now I'm not concerned about now I'm also not certain about the upside it may go to 110 it may go to 111 it may go to 112 so that is also uncertain but I don't consider that as a risk because in all those scenarios I'm making money I'm not really concerned with that so I use a more layman's perspective on it so you can th you should be aware of both the perspectives in classical finance they talk about risk as if it's uncertainty now uncertainty applies on both sides yeah because even your profits are uncertain okay so but the adopt the perspective that I'm adopting is that we are defining risk only as a downside risk the risk of losses okay so we are not defined we are not considered we are departing from the classical finance view well I don't think that view is very useful okay so when you're looking at standard deviation as a measure of risk you understand standard deviation is both both sides above and below the mean both sides right so standard deviation as a measure of risk when it's being used in classical finance you have to understand that the implicit definition the implicit understanding of risk is that both sides both types of uncertainty are considered as risk that's why they are using standard deviation as a measure of risk is this clear to everyone so you'll see that everywhere in classical finance we use standard deviation as a measure of risk and as you know standard deviation covers deviations on both sides so essentially when you're using that as a measure of risk that means your view is that uh, here both sides are part of my risk okay so it's, it's you could say it's a part of it's a it's a matter of nomenclature so what difference does it matter uh, what difference does it make what you uh, call it you could say that also but I think it's useful to have clear definitions and uh, in in terms of risk when we talk about it, it will make a difference sometimes for your clarity so is this point clear yes. okay that we are going to discuss risk from a one-sided perspective that we for us risk only means the risk of loss okay profit uncertainty we don't really concerned whether I make $150 or I make $135 I'm not really concerned about that because when I'm entering the trade my main concern is basically because that, that, that's not eating into my risk capital whether I made one make 135 or I make 150 or I make 165 that's not going to eat into my risk capital what will eat into my risk capital is when I make a loss is this clear okay so it's a different perspective so you should be aware of these two different perspectives and you should be aware that the use of standard deviation to measure risk mm. implicitly uh, suggests that the perception is that both sides of the coin uh, both types of uncertainty are considered equally bad that's what it is right but in fact obviously it's not equally bad right we are mainly concerned only with risk protection because as you can see here I have only placed a stock but I've not placed a take profit because I don't use take profit because I'm not really concerned with it, as long as I and because I don't believe in the targeted method I prefer the trailing stop method so targeted take profit so so therefore uh, both sides are not equal okay so that's the first point to get out of the way as far as risk is concerned all right so the first point is clear these are all happening in your notes so everything is written down so we are now so these are the five types of risk that we have talked about now, I'm not going to discuss all the five types in detail because for the purposes are because we don't have time so the purposes are uh, we will revisit this if we do the case uh, on uh, corporate treasury risk management later okay but the main the most important two two most important types of risk are, are what we are going to cover okay so market risk and credit risk market risk as you can see here basically you have already seen it yourself you buy the shares of uh, TCS and then the share price drops so that's your market risk okay so you bought it maybe you invested 10 million dollars to buy it but now the value of those those shock uh, stock holdings is only nine million dollars so you're showing a mark to market loss of one million dollars so this when you bought it the possibility that you could have lost money on it because of the share price moving down that's what we call market risk okay where basically assets which are being actively <laughs> traded in markets okay which what have I written here as prices of assets fall prices of liabilities rise okay that is if you have a loan in yen let's say an Indian company has a loan in yen okay that let's say has a certain rupee value at a point of time when you take the loan okay so when you take a loan in yen and uh, let's say we take uh, since we're talking about dollar yen let's talk about a US dollar a US company okay so let's say Procter & Gamble has a loan in and has taken a loan in yen okay Procter & Gamble maybe is not a good example because they have revenues in yen but let's look at some other company let's say which um, let's say so the Intel doesn't have let's assume that uh, some some uh, company let's say maybe uh, Chesapeake Energy has has no revenues in yen and they have taken a loan in yen okay so their financials are in US dollars okay so their liability is a yen liability okay you will see this later on obviously in your in your uh, in the case as well but they have a yen liability and that the yen liability has a certain dollar value 
because their financial is in dollars you can't show a yen amount on their balance sheet you can't write a yen amount on their balance sheet you have to write a dollar amount right it may be a yen loan but you have to write the dollar equivalent value of that loan when you are making their balance sheet right so how will you come out with a dollar equivalent value you will take this current rate if you are making the balance sheet now you will take let's say it's a 5 billion yen liability then you will divide that 5 billion yen by this 10927 that is the market rate at this time when you are making the balance sheet that gives you a dollar value right and that's your dollar value that you are what you are going to put on the balance sheet that is the val dollar value of the yen loan why liabilities rise now what happens is the now if the yen strengthens dramatically if the lens, yen strengthens let's say to 104 okay let's say at the end of the next quarter the yen strengthens to 104 Now what is happening? See the yen loan amount has not changed. The yen loan amount is still five billion yen. Okay, but now what has happened is you are dividing five billion by earlier you divided five billion by one o nine twenty seven. Now you are dividing five billion by one o four. So the dollar value will be higher now when you divide by one o four. Is this clear? Right. So what has happened because of the exchange rate movement? The dollar value of their yen liabilities has gone up. Yen amount is fixed, but they are actually they don't have revenues in yen, so they are going to take their dollar revenues and buy back, yeah. buy yen in the foreign exchange markets and repay that yen loan, right? So they are concerned with this. So here is another example of market risk, not necessarily on the asset side. That's why I've written this as prices of assets fall. So I've given a balance sheet based definition. prices of any asset you own if the value of the asset drops okay that's uh, uh, that's also market risk okay and here prices of liabilities rise value of liabilities rises that is also bad for you this is clear can you see now yes liability value rising means okay uh, that this is also bad for you okay so let's look at uh what have we written here if we can improve the definition prices of assets fall uh prices of um, liabilities rise we can write this a little bit better we can um yeah it's okay we can write it as prices because what is happening in this situation please make sure everybody understands normally we would call it a we would say normally that the value of the liability has gone up we i use the expression dollar value of the liability has gone up okay but you can also call it the dollar price that 5 billion yen now has to be bought in the market with dollars and your each dollar each dollar is worth only 104 yen right now so the dollar price of that 5 billion yen has gone up so it, this definition is okay all right although in layman's terms when we use the when we have the discussion we say the value of the li do dollar value of the liability has gone up but actually it's the price you can also say it's the price is this clear am i making sense any time you don't understand so should be price so it can not be value yeah but when we say uh, when we talk about the balance sheet sometimes we say these use the, yeah you're right it is it is not value because it's not subjective you're right about that okay so but again when we normally have this course if you see uh, when we talk about the balance sheet sometimes we say value of the dollar value of my liabilities has gone up we use these expression you're right that it's the correct if we want to always maintain a distinction between price and price and value we should use the word price because in this case it's objective there's nothing uncertain about it when the dollar yen drops to 104 the dollar price of your yen liability is now much higher right okay all right so we have understood this now you have understood market risk very easy to understand so we basically only talk about um Yeah so I have defined liquidity risk as basically like in the 2007 credit crisis a lot of the mortgage backed securities people were holding they had they basically dropped in price because of lack of liquidity okay lack of enough players in the market okay so I have I have merged liquidity risk into market risk because I'm saying that liquidity risk basically essentially manifests itself quickly as market risk if you're in a market where there's where it's illiquid okay maybe you're trying to sell a house on uh, at in port blair in the andaman islands maybe there's not enough liquidity nobody really wants to stay there so if you want to sell it you'll have to basically deeply discount the price and if you really give it a bargain based bargain based given basement price some guy will come in and buy wall it's a great great deal at this price and then he'll buy it that's what happens in the case of liquidity risk okay so um so therefore i've uh, merged it into this now credit risk so market risk everyone's clear now okay credit risk credit risk is basically a borrower defaulting trade counterparty walking away from deal 
any such situation like you know that recently you had all these kind of any kind of situation it did not be a official bankruptcy filing okay although nowadays it's very easy under a new bankruptcy law to get that filing for one default itself but uh, the, any kind of situation where there are financial difficulties and some loan doesn't get paid or some commercial supplier doesn't get paid some guy who has supplied chairs maybe to some uh, you know during a conference room construction in ILFS and ILFS got into financial difficulties they are not able to pay okay so uh, any any time you have a commercial transaction with somebody and the other guy on the other side of the contract uh, fails to pay okay it may be due to uh, unwillingness to pay so when we are talking about failure to pay it could usually be due to either ability to pay and willingness to pay okay so sometimes you know you have this term in india called willful defaulter <laughs> like some people some of the banks were trying to def uh, classify uh, label vijay malia as a willful defaulter okay and uh, for example i remember once in calcutta high court they shot it down they shot down that uh, label but anyway so the willful defaulter concept relates brings out this concept of uh, willingness to pay versus uh, maybe we can bring it i can just write it briefly here although it's so um, default okay i'm not going to write equal to ability stroke willingness to pay so i may have money like vijay malia but i don't want to pay okay so you could have a default so if this default could have uh, could be driven by uh, willingness to unwillingness to pay okay it could relate to the willingness to pay or lack of it or it could also relate to ability like you're genuinely out of funds like lehman, Bro lehman brothers basically they, eventually they were just they were not in a position to pay the question of willingness did not arise they didn't have the money to pay okay uh, so because nobody was willing to deposit with them etc so it could be either all right so that's why when you have this term like a willful defaulter it brings out the difference between the ability to pay and the willingness to pay all right so uh, credit risk is also fairly clear now that if you have any transaction any kind of contract with anybody that's why i've written it as trade counterparty walks away from deal and you're basically your one party is if you want to write this in terms of contract law then you write it as basically one party is not willing to honor its obligation under the contract credit risk if i give a furniture order if i go to a furniture shop and ask him to de design some furniture for my living room he comes and delivers everything let's say all on credit no advance payment he comes and delivers all the furniture sets it all up in my room and now i tell him get lost i'm not going to pay you okay so he can sue me but the point is right now he has a problem obviously litigation is always expensive and time consuming so he does have a credit risk problem right now because one of his customers is not willing to pay okay so any kind of situation like that that's credit risk okay so is this clear we've got these two definitions out of the way right so now we are going so i'm not going to cover the other types but since i did a text since i was talking about these two risks uh, you can just read about this on your own and uh, we can uh, so so i just wanted to make sure that we understand market risk and credit risk uh, the distinction between these two okay so sometimes you can also have a, uh, there is a connection between the two as well which is like for instance if you see the all the people who had contracts outstanding with lehman brothers when they had uh, uh, all the people who had contracts outstanding with lehman brothers when they went when they defaulted okay those people were actually facing credit risk okay but their credit risk is actually arising mainly because of market. the market risk it's driven by market risks a little bit by lack of liquidity in that because when the market panic set in and when liquidity is also not a constant thing when there's when these uh, mortgage backed securities were trading very well in 2006 2007 to the early part of 2007 the trouble started in june of 2007 actually okay but up until then everything was hunky dory right everybody was trading actively so everything is fine so market sentiment can just turn on a dime that also you should be aware of right market sentiment pretty much in any market can just turn on a dime here what happened is the market sentiment quickly turned very quickly uh, it turned so up until then everything was fine everything was liquid people were willing to trade it's like musical chairs when people feel that the music is about to stop then things get a little panicky okay so uh, so that's when the market when the market gets panicky people don't want to trade and that's when you see the manifestation of lack, uh, lack of liquidity and that's when you have to sell at what we call fire sale prices okay is this clear okay so it's all connected really so but now we understand market risk versus credit risk okay so let's go on to we are not going to take a anything what is it 
yeah so we say the other term that we say that we say that the risk has materialized when you take a position and then you have this for this phenomenon of people losing or losing money on the position or credit risk when the when the other guy actually tells you when you actually come to know that this Lehman Brothers is not going to be honoring its contract when you come to know we say that this credit risk the credit risk is always there even when I'm dealing with a company like ITC or in the Sun Lever who are very liquid uh, cash rich companies theoretically the credit risk is always there because they may decide that we are not going to pay you okay it's about willingness to pay it might become like willingness to pay but uh, when it actually so the credit risk is always there but when it actually happens that you come to know that Lehman Brothers has filed for bankruptcy and they're not going to be honoring their contracts in the normal way that's when we say that the risk has materialized okay the risk is always present but now it has materialized okay or crystallized or materialized is a better word okay so that's our next topic okay over the counter versus exchange traded I think we need one more um, one sec um, because actually uh, you know so many other pages don't open here so I come prepared I open all kinds of pages in my office and come here because I don't want to get stuck not being able to open a page here okay um, what was I saying what was I saying uh, uh, yeah I need to open this asset classes markets and instruments okay so we're going to learn about this distinction about uh, b uh, between these two types of markets um, So this, what you should also do is you should read this. Uh, this is covered in, I've given you the chapter notes. I mean the chapter references. So if we go here, we do chapter one. Okay. Here itself, you can read it. The reason I'm not teaching you from there is because I, I think it's not very well explained. Uh, because straight away he has talked about, uh, you know, OTC markets and, and uh, central counterparty and all that, which actually is a, is a newer development. So we need to talk about to understand the difference between two topics, two, two different entities. We have to talk about the classical distinction as it has existed for several years, okay, hundreds of years. And then we talk about the new developments. Otherwise, you don't understand the real difference, okay. So you can, you should do this reading, okay. So this 1.1, obviously, you can read the part before that also exchange traded and OTC markets you can see this here so this is included in your coverage okay so you should read this but it's just basically talking about what is what and you should also know what kind of in India also you should know what kind of exchanges exist okay what at least you read the Indian part of the book in your textbook okay uh, remember to do that all your all the textbooks you have so two textbooks so far and both of them both of them wait the door doorkeeper herself has gone out okay so now um, uh, in the Indian uh, remember that uh, in your two books okay there's always that Indian market segment which you should read okay you should that's your responsibility it's just giving you some information it's not really anything there's no concept involved if you get stuck with some concept then you can ask me and then I can explain it okay that's your responsibility to read because you need to know you need to have that kind of information also all right okay so uh, so this I'm yeah yeah I mean, you should know what is the I mean once you understand what system edge is you should never forget it in your life you should know what it is you should know it as you should remember it in your mind see how the information should be organized in your mind is like this that's how you organize information in a modular way which is you should remember the only thing you need to remember is that the system edge is nothing but the uh, mathematical expectation of the system okay now the question arises what is mathematical expectation <laughs> then you then you should call another definition one minute one, let me finish let me just uh, so then you should call in your mind you should call like a program calls uh, your mind should be working like a program you should call mathematical expectation that is summation pi xi okay and so you should also remember that mathematical expectation is also a new not a new concept it's a weighted average it's simply a weighted average which is a much more basic concept which you have learned in early school years weighted average all that you're doing is you're waiting you using the probabilities as the weights 
that's all mathematical expectation is not really a new concept it's just the application of weighted average just it's just that you're using the probabilities as the weights if you remember it this way then it's much harder to forget and the concepts uh, basically are solidified okay so now it's a mathematical expectation of your system and if you're doing an ex ante system edge then those probabilities are based i mean those are ex ante probabilities where it's not historical frequency yeah what is your question Okay. No, so in the case uh, when you can't es estimate the exit price, you can all there's nothing stopping you, like in the sense that, see, suppose in the case of options, um, let's take whatever let's take the crude oil again what's again let's again let's take the crude oil options because that is active see you can always take a view it may not happen see remember i gave you yesterday we were talking about trading in dollar swiss okay or even if i'm talking about trading in dollar yen okay now there's no difference really between trading in dollar yen and trading in crude oil options or microsoft options why because when i'm let's say i'm saying that i am go I'm, i've gone long here at 109.30 okay and i have put a stop here let's say at 108.60 or something if you see this closer it's somewhere like 108.60 or something i've gone long at 109.30 i put a stop at 108.60 okay this takes care of my maximum loss part average risk per trade I look at the average risk per trade and I put my maximum loss now uh, I would like my view is let's say my view is that this thing is going to 114 let's say that's my view okay so I would put let's say uh, if I were using targeted take profit but I would actually again have to go through the system calculations to come up with that okay but whatever suppose I say it's my system calculation tells me that because of the R3 I need to have my take profit here should be at 114 so I put it there now there's no guarantee that it will go to 114 it's the same with you can just replace this dollar yen chart with the chart of an option except that in the case of an option we are saying that we don't need to put a stop because your maximum risk is the premium and we assume that the entire op the option is held to maturity and it will go for unexpired it will expire worthless okay so suppose you have spent two thousand dollars on the premium okay and suppose your r3 is 10 then you have to wait no no i'm saying you may buy several contracts no? you may buy several contracts see one minute one sec one minute Let, one sec one sec let's get this two thousand dollars let's also buy every size step now us equity options the contract size is hundred so when you see an option price let's say if it shows two dollars okay so actually when you buy even one contract of that option okay because these are exchange traded products you are you are these are exchange traded products so as you will see later you will have to trade in contracts and you can't say i want to buy one and a half contracts okay you have to buy an integer multiples of contracts okay so the price of the option is shown as two dollars okay you buy one contract you are actually paying two hundred dollars because contract size is hundred dollars because even your underlying it matches the underlying if you see the in options also one minute see amazon if you want to buy amazon if you want to trade in market lots when the market is open if you are trading in oracle shares this price of oracle shares 55.98 this is price per share but when you do one market lot and in, in uh, this price is for a market lot so when you buy uh, oracle if you buy one lot of oracle you can't buy like 17 shares you have to buy 100 shares because that's the market lot okay so that's 55 the money you have to put up is 55.98 into 100 right similarly when you look at option prices on oracle or on any other whatever okay if the option price is showing let's say 889 let's assume this is the price of an option if the price of the option is shown as 889 let's assume okay this is the price of the option is shown as 889 then if you buy one contract one option contract right you are actually going to pay 8.89 into 100 that's your outlay for one contract right is this clear so contract size should always be kept sight of wherever there is a contract size applicable sometimes in otc markets that's one of the advantages in otc markets you don't have to have contract size i can come and go to a says a dealer and say i want to buy 673,219 swiss francs <coughs> 
that's okay in OTC markets. Okay, so I don't need to worry about contract size. Contract size concern only comes up in exchange traded markets where everything is standardized. Pretty much everything is standardized. Okay, so therefore you have to. Is this point clear? That two thousand dollars. Yeah, if you have, let's say, uh, the price of the option is two, and you are buying, let's say, ten contracts, then you are already buying two thousand. You are spending two thousand dollars. Is this clear to everyone? Yes, Sukriti, are you following? Two dollar option price. Each contract is for hundred shares. So, for if you buy, if you bought one contract, you would have to pay two hundred dollars. You are buying ten contracts, so you nothing stops you from buying ten contracts, integer multiples. So you are spending two thousand. In this case, we assume that your maximum dollar risk per trade in your system calculations has come out to two thousand, and you are buying the two thousand dollars. You are spending two thousand dollars to buy the options, and we are going to treat it as full amount. We are assuming. In practice, obviously, in this kind of a situation, your actual losses will always be will tend to be less because some of the options you may just square out before the expire before expiration. We just make that assumptions for risk. We we make that assumption for risk planning because it gives us much more clarity. Right? Are you following what I'm saying? Yes. For the sake of risk planning, we assume, and position sizing and risk planning, we assume that the entire option premium will be wasted, and it will be held to expiry, and it will expire worthless. So the entire two thousand dollars I spent in buying ten contracts, all of them will expire worthless. I'll hold it to expiration, and I'll lose two thousand dollars. That's for your risk planning, because risk planning, if it is too conservative, that's never going to hurt you in life. If you are risk planning, so if you look at the whole risk management, the way I have taught you risk management, it is an ultra conservative approach to risk management, and that's never going to be a problem. In practice, what you can do always is that even though you assume that you will be, that is for your risk planning, to be more conservative. You plan to lose six million dollars. In practice, you lose three and a half million dollars. Not a problem because you are already ready to lose six million, right? If you plan to lose six million and you lose thirteen million, then it's a problem. right so in this case what what you would actually do is in practice even though for risk planning you assume that the op option expires worthless then the entire premium is lost in practice if your view changes halfway through you would just sell off the option in the market and you will get some recovery are you following what i'm saying in practice when you are trading in practice if your view changes then obviously you should not no longer you should not any longer hold the option you should sell it off and you will get some revenue from selling it off is everyone following okay so in practice what will happen is your actual losses will be less because i presume that all the options will not expire worthless you will be able to sell off some before maturity because your view has turned is this clear so your actual losses will always be worse uh, will be will tend to be less than the worst case scenario or let's say they could well they could well be less than the worst case scenario which is maximum loss on all options bought is this clear is everyone following yeah so coming back let's answer tanya's question first yeah another question is uh, how would we uh, use this 2000 in our uh, system average just per trade so it is per trade so if you have to buy a contract so it would should be divided by like uh, one minute where is your system edge one minute okay let's open one more file hopefully nothing will happen yeah let's open one more file uh fin okay let's have um students calc let's open the calc yeah so what is your question this is sorry i'm sorry i didn't hear the what is the average loss that you calculate for trade yeah so how would we locate this 2000 in our uh, calculation so that we can uh, this 2000 i gave you the example no? when we were discussing i said 2000 how do i come see i look at this option we put it like right? should we add it to that average loss per trade or no it is the average loss per trade one minute it is the how did i come out with a decision first through other calculations and taking a view on the eyeballs and underlying i decided that i want to buy a call and then with the other calculations expiration everything is taken care of i've taken all those decisions now i see that the, the particular call that i want to buy is has a price of 2 dollars okay now the price is showing as 2 dollars but the contract size is uh, is uh, is 100 
so <coughs> if i buy one option contract i'll have to pay 200 dollars excluding commissions okay i'll have to pay 200 dollars then i look at my system risk calculations and i see that my system risk calculation has given me uh, the um, average dollar risk per trade okay average loss or maximum risk per trade has been given as two thousand dollars has come out as two thousand dollars okay so that's how i decide okay per contract size is 200 uh, price is 200 and my maximum risk per trade is 2000 so therefore i can only buy 10 contracts this is clear that's how it's being connected and it can be done by expert analyst suppose there was an example of 41000 something yeah let's 42000 yeah so uh, we calculated the suppose we take it as uh, for the stock stock price not as for the uh, uh, currency exchange because that comes up to 5.5k something. No, those are, ex you are talking about examples, but actually the concepts don't change. Whether you are doing options or you are doing stocks or you are doing, you're doing uh, cash market equities or you are doing uh, equity options or you are doing uh, currency, spot currencies, the calculation principles don't change. Okay, it's just that in the case of options, you are making a particular assumption, which is a little unrealistic. You are making one assumption, which is that every option that is purchased, okay, will be, uh, will expire, uh, will expire worthless. Okay, which actually in real life may not turn out to be that way. Some of them will be, you'll be able to sell off by changing your view. Okay, even on the losing trades, you will lose less than the maximum dollar risk per trade. Is this clear? Does it answer your question? What were you asking about spot and all that? Nothing changes. This whole calculation of this uh, system edge and all this stuff is totally based on, we have a few variables, total number of trades, percentage losers, that automatically gives you percentage winners. Then you have an R3 which gives you the average win and the R3 basically comes and the average win basically comes into if you look at it in terms of process the investor will have some kind of expectation that i want 113 percent return and that will give you a dollar amount of profit you need to make divide multiplied by the investor invested capital you'll get the dollar amount of profit that you need to make from that using the system edge you can figure out the uh, because this dollar amount of profit is the same as the system edge times number of trades so from there you can figure out the system edge and you have already made assumptions about total number of trades and average loss okay so the only thing unknown is the average win so from this you can figure out the average win so then you know that you have to wait like if you are r3 in this case where the uh, maximum risk per trade let's say is two thousand dollars in option trading in your system calculations and let's say your r3 is seven that means when you have a profitable option trade you can't take profit on that option trade unless you have made fourteen thousand dollars because two thousand is the risk you put on and your r3 according to your system calculation is seven so you have to wait before you take profit on a winning option trade you have to wait until the option value has uh, swollen to fourteen thousand dollars is everyone clear about what we are talking the thinking does not change in any way whether you are doing spot currency trading or spot equity trading or um, option trading because it's all based on uh, assumptions about total number of trades percentage losers return on invested capital okay maximum risk per trade those kind of things it doesn't change anything whether you trade yeah you multiply rc into the average uh, loss loss if you see average average win yes no no you don't multiply here one minute let's look at this how do you arrive at average win you multiply the average loss into the r3 because what is r3 see in industry in industry people normally in people in industry people normally say risk reward ratio okay but that's actually not correct english use of the happy use of the language because if we say risk reward ratio it automatically implies that risk is in the numerator and the reward is in the denominator am i right normally when you say risk reward ratio it would imply that it is risk is in the numerator and reward is in the denominator okay but actually most of the time people are talking about this r3 that's why i have defined r3 as reward to risk ratio now that makes much more sense because we are putting the average win in the numerator and the average loss in the denominator so now the language makes more sense do you agree yes. that that's why 
I am not even talking about risk reward that the word two is missing. So if I now make it very explicit and I say reward to risk ratio, that is A to B ratio. Now clearly A is on top, B is at the bottom. The language is very clear because that's why every word is important. That's why I keep telling you you have to talk properly. You have to you have to use the right words because language is how we communicate. So therefore you have to be very particular about this, right? So is this clear? That's why you're multiplying, okay? Because uh, you have defined the R three as the reward to risk ratio, okay? Is everyone clear so far? Okay. All right. So let's go back now. We have understood market risk and uh, this risk. Okay. Where was I before? <coughs> okay. I was going to this. That's when Shochi's question came. We were going here, right? That's where we were. Okay. So now you can see ET ET markets uh, ETM. I'm just going to say o ETM and OTC OTCM because these words are very big. I don't want to keep saying them again and again. Okay. ETM and OTCM. You can see straight away, and you can you should read that chapter one and two of uh, Hull also, the parts which I've given 1.1, 1.2, or whatever. Then um, those are just stories. It's like stories. It's not really very conceptual, but you get to know what is what. Some of it you can see here also. So here we know that mainly uh, currencies, although they have put. You notice in the case of currencies, I put OTC markets and exchange traded markets because currency markets trade in both venues. Both types of venues. We'll see what they are. First, I'm just giving you a flavor, and then um, you know how to relate uh, these concepts to this framework. Okay. Uh, so currencies trade in both situations. Okay. Uh, usually, uh, futures. Uh, futures. You notice there's no OTC market under futures because futures are all basically all exchange traded markets. Okay. Now forwards are OTC markets. This is the distinction between futures and forwards. So another way to distinguish between futures and forwards is to understand uh, that forwards are always OTC instruments and futures are always exchange ETM okay so therefore whatever is the distinction between o OTC and ETM uh, in fact I'm not going to say OTCM I'm just going to say OTC that will mean OT OTCM okay so uh, ETM versus OTC whatever is the difference that is the difference between futures and forwards futures are ETM and forwards are OTC okay so that's another way when we see those instruments when we see them so you notice others we have put like in this way because certain types of swaps are also traded on exchange traded markets but mainly they are OTC markets mainly swap markets are OTC but I had to put this because certain exchanges do trade swaps they're not very popular not very liquid but they do trade there so and options again are both OTC and ETM okay so this is basically what it is you already understand the framework so this is how we organize the information okay so some markets trade in both venues here you can see okay like here these instruments these are actually OTC FX prices these are spot FX markets these are OTC so let's understand first OTC markets everyone is clear so far we are just giving you some ideas now we'll just talk about um, let's talk about this where is the clock yeah let's first understand OTC markets okay maybe I, I should make this even smaller to help you understand OTC markets can you guys read the uh, you can see this here if we make this now you can see everything right the clocks are not important you can see the bottom the Kulkit, can you read Los Angeles? Yes, sir. You can read it. Okay. You guys can see from there. Others uh, can see. Okay. All right. So this is let's imagine now there's a bank in each of the centers. Let's first understand OTC markets. Okay. Even better understanding, uh, even more basic understanding of OTC markets is everyone is familiar with a local grocer who is giving credit is a lot of local grocers sell on credit to the various households in their locality right so you pay the bill only at the end of the month and during the month you keep on requesting him for material please send me two kilos of sugar please send me a toothpaste and so on and so forth so the guy is basically piling up bills so you is supplying all the material to you but he's not getting any money he will get paid at the end of the month now supposing at the end of the month you tell him to get lost no money okay then he has a materialization of what kind of risk 
market risk or credit risk credit risk okay so basically the point to understand the reason I wanted to make that distinction between market risk and credit risk at the beginning before discussing OTCM and ETM is that in OTC markets you are faced with both market risk and credit risk okay but in in exchange in the classical form of OTC markets okay so some of those distinctions are changing now but that those are very new developments so we have to understand the classical difference between OTC and ETM so in OTC markets you have both uh, market risk and credit risk everyone understands this credit risk now same concept here if you see let's say uh, CBA Sydney CBA is a Commonwealth Bank of Australia and Sydney deals with let's say um, uh, Wells Fargo in Los Angeles okay they do a foreign exchange transaction this is how OTC markets function okay these guys call them up Sydney night desk of CBA in Sydney deals with uh, Los Angeles in uh, West Wells Fargo in Los Angeles they their treasuries do a deal let's say where they let's say uh, Sydney buys um, 10 million dollars of against the yen for value spot okay they buy 10 million dollars against the yen so they're obviously Sydney is buying dollars and selling yen okay now what happens is on the day so this is a spot value transaction so after two business days everyone is following so far and let's say that the dollar yen trade the rate is 109.30 okay so at 109.30 they do this deal um, okay and uh, so uh, CBA Sydney has bought dollars 10 million dollars and sold yen is this clear okay so since they have sold yen remember this is a contract to exchange asset every transaction in a financial market is a contract to exchange assets is this clear remember because the market is a venue for exchanging assets and so a transaction is a contract to exchange assets now once you enter into a contract to exchange assets you have to fulfill your obligations under the contract eventually you have to deliver the whatever you decided to sell you have to deliver it and whatever you decided to buy you have to receive it is this clear okay yeah so C uh, CBS Sydney has bought 10 million dollars against the yen so they are entitled to receive 10 million dollars and the rate is uh, 109.30 so 10 million dollars into 109.30 whatever is the yen amount that they have to deliver to uh, Wells Fargo Los Angeles is this clear these guys will have a yen account have you guys done your banking course already okay so there are these things called nostro accounts and bostro accounts and all that you have done it before nostro accounts okay okay so anyway nostro account is nothing we can just it's it's uh, it's just a casual mention that so wells fargo just like the sydney cbs sydney their home currency is australian dollars not us dollars but they need to maintain a us dollar account with somebody in uh, new york okay they will have to maintain a, a us dollar account with somebody in new york okay so J jp morgan new york they have let's say um, you can see that they have a, let's say they have a nostro account so they will tell wells fargo los angeles you pay my dollars to when you do the transaction when you do the foreign exchange transaction you have to also give your instructions so after they do the deal they will say my dollars to jpm new york okay so these guys know and then they'll give the account number okay so these guys in wells fargo los angeles know which account has has to receive that 10 million dollars into which account should i pay it for the credit of cba sydney are you following they're just maintaining a dollar account like i maintain a rupee account with hdfc right they're just maintaining a dollar account with uh wells fargo with uh, say jpm new york this is sydney Sid sydney's nostro dollar nostro account similarly uh, wells fargo los angeles has has a yen nostro account with let's say bank of tokyo tokyo okay so bank of tokyo tokyo they will say my yen to bank of tokyo tokyo account number one two three four okay and so sydney two days later sydney has to ensure that two days later that yen account that these guys mentioned that account is paid uh, is credited with the yen amount 10 million dollars into 10930 whatever is the yen amount are you following the transaction very basic right you have agreed to exchange assets now you have to fulfill your agreement you have to deliver the asset that you sold you have to receive the asset that you bought that's all that is happening i'm just giving you some of the details of the deal this is clear okay so now so what happens sydney two years two days later sydney makes sure that the money goes to tokyo to the uh, yen nostro of wells fargo los angeles Wells Fargo Los Angeles's yen nostro in Tokyo is credited by CBS Sydney with the yen amount of the trade 
yeah okay but since tokyo time obviously as you can see here tokyo time is you can see here tokyo has already closed sydney has already closed they will open later okay now new york has not yet opened right now only london is open okay all right so these guys before they go to bed their uh, settlements people the back office people don't work in the night desk so these guys have already taken care of the payment two days later okay when we come to two for two days forward the sydney back office of cba has already taken care of the yen payment they have made sure that the yen goes to the yen nostro account of wells fargo los angeles with bank of tokyo tokyo this is clear they have already taken care of the payment because you have to send a telex please debit our yen account with so and so and pay it to so and so right you have to take care of the payment you have to give, make sure the payment takes place so they have already transferred the yen to the yen nostro of wells fargo but when uh, new york opens new york is still not open when new york opens suddenly what happens is wells fargo declares bankruptcy let's say the us regulator takes the uh, the bank into maybe they have a lot of creditors problems bad loan problems they put that bank into receivership so let's say it's like a bankruptcy uh, filing so the us regulators basically force wells fargo to declare bankruptcy so no payments are going to go now once you declare bankruptcy everything stops okay because the receiver will not take care of everything okay and so he'll not pay out any money so that payment that wells fargo los angeles was supposed to make of 10 million dollars into the Nos dollar nostro account of cba sydney that payment is not going to happen they have paid out their money but they don't get the money that they were supposed to get okay so this is the problem with otc markets this is how they function and trillions of dollars you can see in the um, in the textbook where they have talked about the size of the otc derivative markets i don't know where exactly um, somewhere in the yeah he's talking about market size look at this okay so he's talking look at the difference in the size okay OTC versus exchange traded. OTC is a solid line. Okay. Payment is not happening because CBA Sydney has their obligation was to pay yen. They have already paid the yen. It's out of their hands. They were supposed to receive dollars from Wells Fargo, but the settlements people who come into office to make that payment to JP Morgan New York for cre uh, credit of CBA Sydney, that those people are not allowed to make payments because the receiver has taken over the bank. The bank has now declared bankruptcy. So the bankruptcy manager, the insolvency manager will now take care of all the money. Typically the first thing they do is they stop all payments. When, when you are managing a resolution, uh, so like in India, we have the resolution professionals, okay, we are managing the ba bankruptcy. The first thing the guy will do is stop all payments. No payment, you want to pay me money, fine, but I am not paying anybody anything, okay. The first thing they do is that, they stop all the payments. So these guys who are supposed to make the payment, take care of the telex instructions, please pay account to so and so. None of that is going to happen because the back office is not going to function for any outward payments. Okay. So therefore this money that they were supposed to receive, they don't receive it because Wells Fargo has declared bankruptcy. Is this clear? Are you following? So this is the fundamental problem of OTC markets that not only do you have to deal obviously when CBS Sydney buys dollar yen, if they buy $10 million against the yen, they have market risk because the dollar yen could collapse, go to 106 in a few minutes and they would lose big money on their position okay <coughs> but that's market risk but in addition to that they also have credit risk as you can see here because they paid out they, they did their part of the deal but the other party does not fulfill its contractual obligations because they have declared bankruptcy and you can see the mismatch of timings you can see from the way the foreign exchange market works because all over the world banks are trading but the back office functions only during office hours so these poor cba sydney guys they paid their back offices paid the yen amount but because new york opens much later so they don't receive they thought okay at night we'll get the money in the dollar account when new york opens but new york opens but the money goes me they're sitting with wells fargo it's sitting with wells fargo but under the control of the bankruptcy administrator it is now with it is wealth with wealth. it's not that wells fargo have, has no money to pay they can pay but all payments because of bankruptcy filing all payments have been stopped 
Okay, so you could say it is willingness to pay in some ways. <laughs> it's a credit risk. Okay, so are you following what is happening? So in OTC, obviously this doesn't happen all the time because you can see the size of the OTC markets. It's a massive market. Okay, but thousands and millions of transactions are happening every day. This doesn't happen all the time. But I'm giving you this example to show you that this can happen. This can always happen in any case okay this can happen to any bank because this is the problem of the OTC markets that you are not um, basically you are not uh, sorry the point is the, the point I'm trying to illustrate through this transaction is that they have both market risk in OTC markets you have both market risk and credit risk this is clear and this is how OTC markets function you have to this is the best way to think about OTC markets the graphic imagine there's a bank in each of the centers and all of these guys are connected to each other through telephones telex machines Reuters dealing other kinds of machines there's a network there's a communication network they know how to contact each other it's not like I don't know what is the number for DBS Singapore it's not like I know all the numbers I know the banks in all the centers and I'm dealing with them regularly okay so there's a bank in each center so they're all connected through some kind of informal or formal communication network okay and that's it and then they deal with each other but every time they deal they have this kind of risk so what just happened in the CBS Sydney versus Wells Fargo Los Angeles transaction that can happen in every transaction theoretically theoretically this can happen in every transaction you could have sent your payment but the other guy doesn't send his payment and then you're stuck you can of course sue them what will happen is now Wells Fargo will sue they will file a claim with the administrator of the of the of the of the company the bankruptcy administrator they will file a claim that we are owed this 10 million dollar now whether they get that money that is up to the uh, sweet will of the bankruptcy administrator he will see how many assets he can recover and based on that so it's a basically a it's like going into litigation it's a headache you don't get your payments in the normal course of business that's the whole point if you don't get payments in the normal course of business that's basically credit risk manifestation of credit is this clear are you following that's why we say default company is insolvent when they are not able to pay their debts as they fall due okay of course you sue me in court after 10 years of court litigation the court orders me then i have an obligation to pay that's not called getting money on time that's why it's not due debts as they fall due as they fall due in the normal course of business is this clear so has everyone understood that in this in otc markets you have both market risk and credit risk market risk exists because you buy dollar yen it could collapse to 106 in a few minutes you're losing big money that's market risk and here this is credit risk you were supposed to receive the dollars you paid out the yen but you didn't get it that's credit risk can happen everywhere the point here is that CBS Sydney has no other recourse when they were dealing with Wells Fargo they knew that the credit risk of Wells Fargo is completely on them they can't go running to say NatWest London and say guys could you help us why don't you pay us some of the money they can't go anywhere okay so the risk is totally on them so the credit risk is basically the idea here is that's where you come to the first important point in ETM this note I have shifted into your folder so you can access this file okay now you may not be able to read everything because I want to make sure that everybody can see both the columns so I'm making it really small in terms of zoom but this is where we come this is now you have understood we exchange traded I have not covered but at least this part you have understood that counterparty credit risk this is called counterparty credit risk credit risk you have already understood counterparty is because in this transaction CBA Sydney's counterparty is Wells Fargo Los Angeles right that's why we call it counterparty credit risk is this clear credit risk everybody has understood counterparty credit risk okay now so what are we saying here I'm going back to the framework counterpart yeah OTC markets in Chile, uh, transactions which are done without supervision of SEC or the market regulator that is what that's not necessarily correct because the market regulator does have some uh, sometimes some say in the OTC market. they are less regulated than ETM but so I would not define it this way it is very clearly this is the definition what I'm positioning on this is the definition this is what you should understand in terms of concept that counterparty credit risk is managed directly by the counterparties themselves it sounds like a big sentence okay it's already there but you have already understood what it means I gave you the example when CBS Sydney does not receive that 10 million dollars from Wells Fargo 
they can't go anywhere and say that oh my god ACC, SEC can you help us maybe some bank controller in uh, bank regulator in California can you help us no they can't go anywhere because they understood that the terms of the contract are such that the counterparty credit risk is managed directly by the counterparties themselves the two counterparties CBS Sydney Wells Fargo LA they are on the hook if the other guy defaults they are on the hook themselves they can't go anywhere else is this clear so this is the first important for property of OTC markets it operates like a network okay so risk is higher obviously on the other side in ETM we are going to write risk is lower so obviously this property will not exist in ETM the situation in ETM is going to be something different okay so this is the uh, the point that counterparty credit risk is managed directly by the counterparties themselves this is exactly what you need to understand okay this thing is this file is in your in your folder okay. all right so where are we okay is this the first is this is clear now let's look at uh, let's look at this okay let's look at the corresponding situation in the case of an exchange what are exchanges these are some of the exchanges okay CME group I don't know why this page is not loading ice is an exchange intercontinental exchange they have changed their name to ice okay all right so this is these are all examples of exchanges let's see what happens in the case of an exchange who has gone out without closing the door from Ritesh okay what are we writing in the case first let's understand what we are writing okay guys is everyone following is everyone following okay so we saw that in the case of OTC so what are we observing about OTC markets we are observing that let me just write it here market risk plus market risk and credit risk is this clear so it's not looking pretty but I'm just writing it here you understand what this means because the counterparty credit risk is managed by the counterparties themselves so when you're trading in OTC markets you have both market risk and credit risk on your head is this clear now we are going to make this a point of distinction obviously and what are we going to write in the OTC markets in the ETM what do you think which one of them will drop out which one do you think will drop out in, OT in ETM credit risk will drop out market risk is always going to remain okay because you have already seen it firsthand you have been trading ex uh, options on the US exchanges you have been trading NSE stocks you did have market risk but you did not have credit risk so the fact that you had market risk so market risk only so this is one of the distinctions obviously that you have to understand but it's related to same the same point that counterparty now what happens in this is basically that uh, looking at now what happens in between in in the case of exchange traded markets. so if you look at an exchange traded market like CME okay all the markets that they have okay or because I have not accepted their um, they have changed the format of their page okay all the different types of uh, instruments that they trade all of them will have one feature okay what is that feature let's look at um, maybe I have um, where is that um, there's a brochure actually I wanted to just look at the brochure I don't know the brochure yeah I think it should open here okay read the brochure okay we're gonna open it now think of this what would happen is let's take the same OTC market example and let's let's uh, transform it a little bit to come to exchange traded markets okay what we are going to do because counterparty credit risk is being managed directly between the two counterparties each of them is responsible for the others loss they're uh, on the hook for the other guys loss uh, uh, you know any losses from credit risk now they decide to put somebody in the middle okay they decide to put a clearing house in the middle whose responsibility is now instead of having one contract between CBS Sydney and uh, Wells Fargo Wells uh, LA we have two contracts we put a middleman we have one contract between the middleman and CBA and we have one contract between the middleman and Wells, uh, Wells LA 
Is this clear? We have just split up the same contract. The middleman doesn't really have any say in the contract terms. <coughs> The, the contract terms are decided by the two parties okay the middleman is only there to administer the contract and make sure that nobody defaults are you following what my the statement is okay we are just going to put a middleman in between and his job is only to administer the contract when once it has been uh, established once the contract has formed so formation of contract negotiation between parties what should be the terms 10 million dollars 15 million dollars okay you can go your time has come <laughs> that, that sounds like a very prophetic statement. I was wondering why. I was wondering for a while why Surbi is getting restless. Okay. Yeah, welcome. Okay. So, um, alright. Are you following now? What are we trying to do? We are just trying to deal with. We are just trying to. What? Why is it urgent? Okay, okay, go. Okay, guys, now let's try and improve the situation in the OTC markets. Let's just try and put a middleman in between whose job is only to administer the contract and ensure that nobody defaults. He has no say in the terms of the contract, whether it should be at a current market rate, okay, or there should be a limit order or something like that. He has no say in that. Once the contract is formed, okay, he will administer the contract. He's standing in the middle. Let's look at the CME. Um, why is the brochure not opening? Right. Okay, good. Let's look at it this way. Now, imagine you forget uh, all these other people. Just look at the OTC customer and the OTC dealer. Okay. And forget everybody else. And then you have this clearing, CME clearing in the middle. Now we are talking about exchanges. Okay. So these guys, this guy doesn't exist. This guy doesn't exist. This guy doesn't exist. For the moment, just understand this. This guy exists, the CME clearing house. You have the dealer and you have the customer. Okay. Now let's say that, let's assume that uh, CBA Sydney is the customer and Wells LA is the dealer. Okay. And you have the clearing house. So earlier they were dealing only between themselves, this orange part, OTC market okay and now they are going to go now they once to form the contract okay they submit the contract let's assume actually basically the deal on the exchange itself so you have two contracts one between this guy and this guy one between this guy and this guy is this clear you have two you have two contracts okay one minute okay what did we say here that CBS Sydney buys 10 million dollars against the yen at 109.30 on values value spot from wells law la okay so wells la is selling yen amount at 109.30 yen equivalent of 109 of 10 million dollars at 109.30 value is spot so two business days later okay so now two business days later sydney cba sydney uh, we'll just call it sydney sydney fulfills its obligation under the contract and delivers the yen but la does not deliver its obligation does not perform its obligations okay so now sydney has a problem to avoid this problem we are setting up an administrator of the contract in between after the formation of the contract who has no say in the terms of the contract what rate what amount what market he is not involved with all that he is only involved with the administration the proper administration of the contract and to ensure that contract is executed faithfully by both parties that both parties discharge their obligations to so use the legal language to ensure that both parties discharge their obligations on the under the contract is this clear everyone is following all we are trying to avoid is that situation so we have set up the cme clearing house in the middle so now we are going to have two contracts now what is going to happen sydney is going to buy dollars against yen at 109.30 one contract between Sid, uh, sydney buying dollars at 109.30 from the clearing house we'll call it cme to use short words we're going to call the cme clearing house cme so now sydney is buying 109.30 one 10 million dollars against the yen from cme okay now in turn cme is buying 10 million dollars against the yen at 109.30 from la is this clear so one minute it to yeah basically that's what they're doing yeah they are not they are just putting themselves in the middle but there are two contracts the point is earlier there was only one contract 
earlier there was only one contract between the two parties themselves directly is this clear yes. earlier there was an OTC markets there was only two now what we are trying to do is we are trying to understand ET mark ETM by suggesting some modifications to OTC that's what I'm that I'm just teaching you the concept in that way how do we get to ETM it's as if we are trying to get to ETM by introducing some modifications to OTC. Is this clear? That's how I'm just introducing the concept to you. Okay. So, uh, so that you can see the advantages uh, on the credit risk side. Is this clear? So there are two contracts now. Earlier there was one contract. Uh, Sydney buys one of ten million dollars at one nine thirty from uh, against the yen from LA. Now there are two contracts. Sydney buys one of nine thirty ten million from CME. CME buys 10 million dollars against the yen one on the same terms CME buys 10 million dollars from LA now there are two contracts okay now this guy will ensure that nobody defaults is this clear are you following everybody so first this gentleman comes after the contract has been signed yeah but in fact what happens is you're trading on the exchange so whether he comes after or before doesn't matter but the deal is that he can't interfere in the terms of the contract his job his job is only to ex ensure that everybody discharge their obligations under the contract after its form what is the right clearing house yeah. it's a clearing house okay etm now we are talking about etm right so it's an exchange clearing house see that's why I call, they call it cme clearing can you see that cme clearing so like in India every exchange has needs to have its own exchange own clearing house okay in the US it's not like that as long as you're affiliated to a clearing house which is approved it's fine okay but this is CME clearing okay but I'm not going to use CME I'm just going to call it CME because it's a shorter word okay is everyone clear so far two contracts okay now the objective of this clearing house is to ensure that nobody defaults or even if they default even if they default okay basically what happens is that obviously that credit risk amount that has already been paid the year amount that's already been paid they can't do anything about it but if they default whatever the replacement of the contract is the replacement of the contract can be done without any loss we'll see how it works Im immediately but basically the objective of the clearing house to ensure that nobody defaults and how do they ensure that okay let's assume that if you see here mark to market you already understand see this is already very this is still uh, I have to make it 75% otherwise you can't see everything yeah there is no mark daily mark to market profit and loss is settled only or realized only at maturity what does that mean it only means this it means that if you are doing a transaction let's say let's say if we have um, yeah dollar forwards okay so this shows you again very um, I don't know if you can see but that you can see that forward dollar exchange rates forward differences for dollar for uh, currency markets are being quoted all the way up to one year so if I do a one-year deal remember settlement date can be different from transaction date okay so if I have bought let's say I am Sydney I bought one ten million dollars <coughs> let's assume this transaction is not spot but it is forward okay and let's assume for the sake of argument that we simplify it and we assume that spot and forward rates are the same so this this is a forward transaction so settlement date is one year and it's a one year forward transaction so settlement date is one year from today okay one year actually and one year and two business days because spot is two year two business days from today so one year will be one year ahead of spot okay so one year let's say we just call it one year so now i have bought 10 million dollars at 109.30 okay now I have bought 10 million dollars at 109.30 now what will happen is that now what can happen is let's say I, in this case say Sydney Sydney has bought 109 at 109.30 10 million dollars LA is a seller of dollars at 109.30 against the yen now it's a one year transaction so a lot of stuff can happen in one year let's say after one year near the end of the maturity of the contract the dollar yen is let's say at 104 okay so who's losing money under this contract the one who's buying which is Sydney 
so sydney is losing big money on this contract so sydney has an incentive to default you have to see who has the incentive all the time sydney has an incentive to default because they are paying they are losing big money on the contract okay now if sydney defaults who is on the hook LA is on the hook because LA thought they were making big money by selling dollar yen at 109.30 and seeing it drop all the way to 104. So LA thought, wow, I'm sitting on big money. Okay. But now suddenly they get bad news because the other guy decides not to honor the contract. This is what happens a lot in commercial transactions. Whenever there is a party sitting on a loss, he will decide get lost. He will tell the other guy get lost. Okay. Yeah, no, you're coming to that. You have already come to the point, but now we'll talk about it. Okay. So now we have seen the one year scenario that in one year's time it drops from 109.30 to 104. Okay. This is clear, everyone. Okay. Now, suppose now what is the job of the clearing? So the point is that now, if after one year when there's a default, okay, these guys were basically making this 109, 109 30 profit, okay, as, from sorry, profit between 109 30 and 104 on 10 million dollars. That profit was being made by on a mark to market profit was there in LA's books. LA was sitting on that mark to market profit. Now you understand mark to market, okay. But suddenly that profit disappears because the other guy says get lost. Okay. So there should be the correct way to handle this is to make sure that LA gets this profit anyway. Right. If we can make sure that LA gets this profit, then everything is okay. <coughs> Nobody is unhappy. <coughs> is that okay? Yeah. They were sitting on a profit of 109.30 minus 104 yes. times $10 million. Okay. If we can somehow make them give this profit then there's no problem uh, if we can somehow make them get this profit then there's no problem right is that okay yeah so that's what the clearing house does now assume that this did not happen over one day this happens over one one night overnight movement let's assume okay now what how does the exchange clearing house deal with it because the exchange see if now we have two contracts we have two contracts so the um, this is Sydney. Sydney is defaulting with uh, uh, the Sydney is the one who's defaulting because they were losing money big time. Okay. Now Wells Fargo, what have Wells Fargo done? They have sold dollars at 109.30 to the clearing house. Now the clearing house can't, they have bought those dollars from, uh, they have, uh, they have, no, yeah, they have this, uh, LA has sold dollars, clearing house has bought dollars. Okay. And so therefore clearing house still has to honor its contract with LA yeah. okay because th these are two different contracts because these guys who have bought dollars from CME they are defaulting the party who's defaulting is Sydney because they bought dollars at a high price and it dropped in value but the problem with the clearing house is the clearing house just because these guys have defaulted they cannot tell Wells Fargo to get lost they can't tell LA to get lost because they have a separate contractual obligation with LA okay so what does the clearing house do essentially okay let's look at this what is the clearing house going to do let's assume that this movement can happen overnight 109 i want to take big movements so that we get an idea 109 30 to 104 okay this movement happens overnight okay and this contract is still for one year okay it's a long contract the clearing house when it enters into these two contracts already makes clear to the parties that I am going to collect daily losses from you and I'm going to pay daily profits to you. That's the only way they can save themselves. So when the clearing house buys one at 109.30 to honor its contract with LA, the clearing house has to buy dollar yen at 109.30 when the market price is 104. So the clearing house is losing all that money because it has to buy the dollars from the market at 104. Okay. Uh, sorry, it, it will buy from uh, LA at 109.30 and it will sell in the market at 104. So it will suffer this loss. So it will ensure that its systems are such that it will make up this loss from uh, Sydney. So what does the clearing house do when you enter into a contract on a, with the clearing house on an exchange, which is all for ETM contracts. All ETM contracts will be with the clearing house. And what does the clearing house do? The clearing house makes it clear that every day every day you will have to make up your losses and every day you are entitled to take away your profits so let's assume that this pro movement between 109 30 i'm going to exceed a little bit okay the time um 
yeah it's exactly time now i'm going to exceed a little bit okay so you'll have to bear with me on that okay so every day the clearing house please make sure you understand okay is this is it better isn't it better if i go from otc to uh, in step by step by just making improvements to otc we are getting to the exchange traded uh, scenario is okay you understand so the clearing house arrangement is always like this that it tells you very clearly that every day you will have to pay up your losses and every day you will receive your profits so assume now that this 10930 to 104 movement happens in the contract is made that sydney buys uh, from cme 10930 10 million dollars and cme buys from uh, la 10930 10 million dollars and after one night itself the dollar yen rate drops to 104 so there is now a massive loss on 10 million dollars 10930 to 104 sydney is facing this loss so the terms of the contract already are that the these guys have to immediately pay the loss the next day so next morning when we will see then the morning if you enter into a contract on the exchange okay by night time when the exchange closes there is a closing price so the exchange will see how much money you're losing according to the closing price and your entry price and the clearing house will ask you to pay up by 11 a.m next morning if you don't pay up they will close out your position okay are you following yeah. so let's say that the the sydney people tell the court exchange that the tell cme get lost i'm not paying you now before they were able to enter into that contract on the exchange itself the clearing house took a deposit they without taking without paying a deposit to the uh, to the uh, exchange clearing house okay you cannot trade on an exchange so the deposit is already sufficiently big the deposit is already sufficiently big you will see that there are contracts have margins each contract has a margin requirement okay so the deposit is already sufficiently big so after one night okay after one night there is a massive loss on the dollar yen position cba is so sydney is showing a massive loss the exchange tells uh, cba you guys have to pay up this amount of loss last night you lost this amount of money you have to pay up immediately by 11 a.m this morning otherwise we'll close out your position in the market okay we're coming to the profit we'll come to the profit L all the other side is already showing a profit so la is la is showing a profit sydney is facing a loss okay sydney is facing a loss so la is showing the same profit we'll come to that later first take care of the loss okay so now sydney decides even if sydney says that get lost i'm not even paying you for tonight's loss for last night's loss but they have already had to put a huge deposit with the clearing house to be able to trade on the exchange to be able to enter into the trade itself they had to pay a huge deposit which is a good faith deposit you have to put up to even enter into the trade so what what the clearing house will do is fine okay suppose suppose, you are, suppose the loss here is equal to three million dollars let's say the loss is three million dollars okay now we are talking about three million dollar loss this guy says that overnight loss of three million dollars i'm not going to pay up but the deposit they would have taken was already big enough like five million or something initially you have to already put up five million so then cme will say fine we'll we'll forfeit your deposit and we will use three million from there to buy the dollars in the market and uh, to to sell the dollars in the market after buying it from la i fulfill my ob obligations with la i buy the dollars and i have to sell it immediately in the market and the market price i realize a loss of three million i will use that five million deposit that you gave me i will fund that loss from the three million loss from that five million deposit you gave me is this clear hmm? no that you will have to look at the contract but no, normally if you were not paid up they may actually forfeit the balance but if you may forfeit huh hmm? but if uh, the transaction is an option to sell it then the exchange is on the on the hook for the balance but normally what they do is they look at the market volatilities and they make sure that your margin is sufficient because next morning at 11 o'clock they will close out your position if you don't pay if you don't pay your losses from the previous night they will close it out by 11 a.m next morning how much movement can happen between one previous day and 11 a.m next morning they have enough money they they take a sufficient margin but you're right you can always miscalculate but generally they conservatively calculate a very sufficient margin so that they are never left out on the hook like that and uh, 
No, no, I'm talking about the loss. I'm talking about the loss. Let's assume we have not calculated what the actual loss is on 10 million, 101.930 to 104. Okay. To save ourselves the calculation, we are assuming that on 10 million dollars between 109.30 and 104, the total loss is 1 million, 3 million dollars. The mark to market loss is 3 million dollars. I'm just assuming it's not correct. It is not correct. I'm saying it's a loss. Yeah, I'm talking about not the transaction side. Transaction size is 10 million dollars. So, sir, uh, where is the 10 million dollars? 10 million dollars we are not concerned with no because see look at what happens look at what happens cme just bear with us let's at least understand this concept clearly cme has two contracts one fellow on one side of the contract is acting funny he doesn't want to honor his contract okay but i have a i have a system for him he has given me deposit which he which he's not going to get back okay i will use his deposit to fund the loss okay he has a five million dollar deposit with me he's not getting it back and to take care of his default i will face a loss of three million in the market i will use that three million out of that five million to fund the loss is this clear ten million dollars i'm not concerned with because it could have been three hundred million dollars also contract size because i am buying three hundred million or ten million from la under my contract with them immediately i'm squaring off that 10 million dollars in the market by selling it off at 104 i'm realizing a loss of 3 million which loss i will adjust against the deposit left to me by sydney of 5 million is this clear so i have no problem i'm not really concerned about whether it's 10 million or 300 million as long as the market can handle that kind of transaction this is clear okay so now you see so what does the exchange clearing house do this is the term these are the terms of the contract before you trade on an exchange every exchange is connected to a clearing house okay all your transactions are essentially you have two contracts okay the clearing house is entering into two separate contracts instead of just having one contract between the parties themselves in the market and this is how an exchange clearing house is able to manage the credit risk because every day it's collecting losses and on the other side so suppose that this guy had honored the contract if this guy had honored the contract okay then what happens this guy has to pay a three million dollar loss last year last night's loss is three million dollars he pays up then the exchange releases the full three million dollars to uh, la they can go and party with that three million dollars it's their money now but then tomorrow next morning if la is facing a loss because remember next morning's calculation is not from 109.30 because now the rate has already been set at 104 so next morning if the rate is next day's next night settlement price if it is 105.30 now la is facing a loss because after the settlement of today's pre nl la is now short dollars at 104 are you following Yes, sir. LA is now fall short at 104 because 109 to 104 they have already been adjusted and paid. Now you're short at 104. Now the next day settlement price is 105.30. Now LA is losing money. Now LA has to pay this money, otherwise their contract will be squared off in the market next morning at 11 a.m. Is this clear? Okay. All right. So what have we covered now? So this is basically what happens. This is an exchange traded market. Although I've given you a clear port example, which is a hybrid example, but forget about the hybrid part. This is what happens on any exchange. When you enter into a contract, there is a clearing house in between. Okay. Party one, party two clearing house. There are two contracts, each party contracting with the clearing house and the clearing house essentially ensures that there is no default or even if there's a default, nobody really loses any money because the clearing house honors its contract with the other guy and how do they make up if they have a loss on honoring the contract they had a loss of three million by honoring the contract with la well they made it up from the deposit given by the uh, the initial counterparty the the defaulting counterparty both counterparties have to put up deposit is this clear okay so they made it up and therefore uh, they, they don't do not have a problem so the the deal is basically you've got to put up an initial margin this deposit is called you can read about it in the book okay in your textbook of those readings which i've given you the deposit is that deposit is called initial margin okay for any exchange traded contract you need to put up some initial margin otherwise you don't get to do the deal okay that initial margin is what we have called five million in this example so any given day if you don't pay up your losses by 11 a.m next morning now 11 could be 10 30 or whatever okay early in the morning 
If you don't pay up, they'll square out your position in the market. They'll cancel your trade and square out your position in the market and they will not face a loss. They will adjust it against your initial margin. Is this clear? Okay. And so that's how, so every day's loss is taken care of and that's how the credit risk is managed in an exchange traded market setting. Is this clear? Okay. So that's why you have this statement in your framework. Counterparty, now you understand what is meant by counterparty you understand both the statements make sure now you see counterparty credit risk managed by exchange by exchange means by exchange clearing house okay i'm equating the exchange with the exchange clearing house is this clear now are you following Bulkit? Yes. and you understand the next mark this statement also daily mark to market settling profit loss daily now you understand what this means yes, that means the counts are pretty basic. every day you have to settle your losses and every day you get to take home your profits is this clear why what this statement means so you already have access to this framework yeah so this is basically the most important difference okay this is the most important difference between exchange traded markets and otc markets okay another example is i'll just briefly cover it which is very simple that if you the the difference is that in exchange traded markets everything is standardized if you look at a futures contract if i look at energy if i go to a remember we looked at the uh, oil futures contract terms of uh, reference if you look at the contract specs we looked at the uh, con where are the contract specs oh the, i haven't even gone into oil futures oil futures trade for 1000 barrels cme oil futures look at this uh, here contract unit 1000 barrels when you are trading on an exchange you have to trade in integer multiples of contract size just like your option contracts you're trading every contract is 100 shares so the price is 1.56 means one actually you have to pay 1.56 into 100 for each contract right because the standard contract size you can't go to the cme oil futures pit and say i want to buy 674 barrels you can't say that everything is standardized okay because it's an exchange so that's one of the things they need to do so this is the second important point basically that you have standardized otc markets you can do whatever you want you can go to trafigura which is one of the biggest oil traders and you can tell them i want to buy 675 barrels of oil they will do it for you that is the main advantage of otc contracts otc contracts are like you saw between the two counterparties they can decide the terms of contract okay there's no need for standardization you can get odd dates if you look at this futures uh, if you look at this uh, forward price these are one month two months three months four months six months these are actually you can actually go to an otc these are otc products foreign exchange forwards you can go to a bank let's say icipnc can go to standard chartered bank in london and say i want a foreign exchange forward contract for one month and two, uh, seven days that's an odd date you don't have to have round months you can take any settlement date you want you can take any amount you want okay all customization full customization otc markets because you could technically say why should anybody trade like this anyway why should i take the credit risk why should i not just trade on an exchange and not have to deal with the credit risk why should i even bother to trade like this you could say that yes. well the only reason you need bother to do that the main reason you bother to do that is this stuff customized contract terms which has a great value in business is this clear yes. all right so there are some other differences which we don't need to worry about we are basically concerned with only two things highly standardized you should check out some of these contract terms to see how highly it is standardized okay the termination of trading settlement prices settlement procedures what kind of crude oil can be delivered you can't take crude oil from uh, saudi arabia and deliver into this contract because it's not covered okay so the, everything is specified okay highly constrained everything is specified highly constrained no flexibility yeah oh you have another class oh my god okay sorry i'm so sorry oh it's already 315 your teacher must have come okay guys so we have understood two important differences is that clear two important differences okay no time for questions now okay